Welcome, everybody, on a winter day. Uh, thank you for braving the weather, and thank you for coming out. My name is Dr. Margot Mountjoy, and I am a sports physician here in Guelph, and it's with great pleasure that um, I bring you all here to this, I think, very exciting night where we can all come together as a community, as professionals, athletes, and interested folks to talk about a very important issue facing our athletes and our children in our community. It is my pleasure, absolute pleasure, to introduce a friend and a colleague, Mr. Ken Dryden. So Ken Dryden is a goalie, as you all know, without an introduction, from Montreal Canadiens from 1971 to 79, during which time the team won six Stanley Cups. Incredible. Member of the Hockey Hall of Fame and Canadian Sports Hall of Fame, also the author of five books, including The Game, and his most recent book, Becoming Canada former Member of Parliament and was the Minister of Social Development in Paul Martin's government. Currently, among other things, he teaches at McGill University. He and his wife, Linda, have two children, four grandchildren, and live in Toronto. So with my pleasure, I'd like to introduce Mr. Ken Dryden. This is an important issue. It, it, it genuinely is, and, and there are lots of things that come and go, and this isn't one that comes and goes. This is one that's around, and it's going to continue to be around. And so it's time. It's time for all of us to have this kind of gathering, this kind of a conversation. Is that 50 years from now, people are going to be looking back at us about something. And what are those somethings that they are going to say about us how could they have been so stupid? How could they not have known? It was there, it was obvious. How could they not have known? I think in terms of sports, it's concussions. And we're at a stage now, I think, where, where we know enough to know that it's a big problem and that none of us knows really what we need to know. Doctors don't really know yet what they need to know. Coaches don't. Researchers don't. Parents don't. Players don't. Sports officials don't. None of us really knows all that we want to know. And we have to go ahead not knowing all that we want to know and make the best decisions we can under those circumstances. And, and we also know that this isn't a string of bad luck. This isn't something where there's a, uh, an epidemic that happens in a, a certain season, but the next season it'll be fine, or the season after. This isn't epidemic stuff. This is stuff that is part of the way in which things are. And so not to, not to treat it as something that is just bad luck. And, and the thing that all of us need to remind ourselves, and it's a, it's a tough one, but is, is that a game is always changing. And if, if, if we had in front of us here, or in, in behind me here, if we had two big screens, and on one screen, was full game action of the late 1950s. And on the other screen, we had full game action of any random game this particular year. And full game action, not highlights. Highlights, anybody looks good in the highlight, and you, it, you, you can't tell anything out of a highlight. Full game action. You would be amazed at what you would see. If you watch them up on a television screen, you would not believe how slow those games were. Unbelievably slow. And so I watched those games, full games, and I had a stopwatch with me. Because what I wanted to do was to measure the amount of time that each player would stay on the ice. And, around, and at that time, the players on average would play about two minute shifts that around a minute and 45 seconds, they would start to look for a chance to get off. They might make it by two, they might not make it until 2.10, 2.15. Henri Richard routinely was over three and a half minutes. 
the thing that was amazing to it is the amount of open space. If you are playing two minutes at a time, you have to play in a kind of coasting and bursting way. You're coasting to see where the action might be or where the opportunity might be. You burst for a chance. You burst back if you've got a defensive problem. Otherwise, you're coasting. At that particular time, there wasn't even the phrase, finishing your check, because nobody was close enough to finish their check. And they weren't going fast enough in order to make up the extra distance in order to finish their check. That was how it was played then. That's how the best played then. The best play now, 35 to 40 seconds at a time. Full sprint. As soon as you go over the boards, you, you know, and the coaches here, you'd better be moving. No watching, waiting, uh, cruising, burst, fly. The whole time that you're out there until you come back over the boards again. The amount of space between players, just about nothing. The amount of time between you and the person with the puck, just about nothing. That with players that are bigger, you've got greater speed, shorter distance, and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and bigger mass of players, and you've got more forceful collisions. It's just a different game. That's okay. Games change all the time. The question is, is that what then do you do to adapt to those games? And people who say, you know, you can't change a game. It's in the essence of a game. It's, it's the purity of the game. I, I say to them, you know, that, that if you knew what the pure game was, you would know that hockey was a game that was once played seven aside, no substitutions. Full 60 minutes, no substitutions. If you knew the purity of that game, you would know that until the mid-1920s, you could not pass the puck forward. That would be a horrible game to play and an even worse game to watch. They all had piles of shutouts because nobody could score with this style of play. So they decided to change it, to allow for the forward pass. This game is always changing. That's the, the, the essence of it. So the question is, is it okay, change to what? I saw the Storm play this year in November. It was against uh, Sarnia, and it was a game, it was 2-2 until late in the third period, and, and the Sting scored one and then scored into an empty net to win 4-2. to two. And it's the first junior game I had seen in a while. And of course, junior players are at the absolute age of disaster. They are old enough to be big enough, to be strong enough, to be fast enough, and they still think they're immortal. And that is a recipe for disaster. And so I'm watching this game, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe, one, how well played it was. The passing is unbelievable. We could never pass that way. Even the best years of the Montreal Canadiens, it wasn't tic-tac, I mean, you know, tape to tape to tape to tape. It was amazing to watch. And, and in spite of 50 opportunities, to do something really stupid, I didn't see one stupid thing in the game. Now, but the rest of the game, played at the level that it was being played at, was played, and with every opportunity to do stupid things, it wasn't stupid. It was amazing. And it was so optimistic, you know, it was, so, it was such an optimistic um, sight to be able to see how you know, a game can be played that's just as exciting to play, just as exciting to watch, and, and had no stupid stuff in it. We're going to have some young athletes first who will come up onto, sta onto the stage and to talk about their experiences with concussions. Then, after they speak, then we'll have some doctors, uh, trainers and physios, those 
who are involved in treatment and also in return to play, for them to tell their story. And then after that, we're going to have a number of people who are the most respected hockey voices and people in the community. So we have you know, the, the, the storm well represented, the university well represented, we have um, uh, on ice officials, off ice people, and so we have that whole range of where in, at, in, that, in our last session in that way, or, or, or part of the evening, of where people can start to talk in terms of what would we do? How, how might we approach all of this? So if we can start, and we'll start again with the young players, and, and what we'll do is we'll just talk one-on-one. -on -one. If first of all, I can ask Clayton Martino to come on up to the stage. And Clayton is a 22-year-old and a former goalie who sustained a concussion getting run over in his goal crease, which is something that kind of happens to goalies now. Goalies don't get hurt very much by pucks or sticks. They get hurt by getting run over. And this was 18 months ago. So Clayton, why don't we sit down and tell everybody about your experience. So I played uh, pretty competitive hockey my whole uh, life until about high school when I uh, stopped. And then when I was about 20 or so, uh, a friend of mine wanted me to play on his beer league team because everybody needs goalies, right? So I was like, okay, I'll play. So um, I was playing, I played a couple of years, and then one random night, um, shot came down, I made a save, my right pad, and it bounced out to the right. And for whatever reason, in a men's league game at 11 o'clock at night, the forward came flying down for the rebound, and then our defenseman, who was actually one of my best friends, uh, tried to hold him up, and I reached out to cover the puck across my body, and both of them crashed into me. And then um, that's really all I remember. I played the rest of the game, but I don't remember that much. Um, and, and what do you, what do you remember? Did you remember feeling anything? Um, I actually, I felt the big pain in my ribs because I think I got a knee in the rib, and I thought I like, broke a rib, and um, so that's what I felt right away. But I just, I didn't feel right, but I wasn't sure what it was really. So um, I went home that night. I remember, I remember driving home, and it was like midnight, and it was so the street lights were so bright, it looked like looking into the sun. Like I couldn't even, I couldn't barely see. So I got home and. Uh, woke my dad up and I was like, I think I need to go to the hospital. So we went there and they kept me overnight in the emergency room with a uh, concussion. You know, they said it was pretty serious, but I wasn't sure how serious it was really. I mean, I didn't feel, I didn't feel very good, but I felt okay. So they're like, well, they just kind of let me go. They didn't really tell me anything. They just said, go home. So I said, okay. So I went home and I wasn't really sure what, what to do. So I just, for a few days, I didn't feel, I didn't feel very good. And, and, and when you say you didn't feel very good, did you feel sick to your stomach, uh, listless? What, what did you feel? Um, yeah, and it was, um, it, was very, it, was hard to, it was hard to look at anything. Like I couldn't look at a TV. I couldn't be in a room with lights on. It was too bright. I had to be in a dark room. Um, you just, I always had a huge headache at all, all the time. Um, I had trouble remembering things. I remember I'd eat dinner. And if you asked me what we ate for dinner later that night, I wouldn't, wouldn't be able to tell you. I wasn't sure. <laughs> so uh, that was a little concerning. And so this was for a few days. And then, and then what? What was the next stage? Um, well, we weren't really sure. I started to feel a little bit better. I wasn't really doing much. And I was thinking, maybe I'll go back and play our next week's game. And my parents were like, no, why don't you take another week off and then try it? I'm like, OK. So I uh, waited a bit longer. And then. It just it started to come back a bit stronger, so I went to my family doctor just to just to check up, and he said, "Okay, we got to pump the brakes a bit here. Like you got you shouldn't be playing, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't go back to work, you shouldn't do any of that." And he gave me a bunch of things. He said, "You should stop doing a lot of this physical activity. You just need to rest. Don't watch too much TV. You don't do any of that. That's what you need to be doing." So that, that caught me by surprise a little bit because I wasn't really sure what to do. And how long did that last? Um, that was about a month, that was about all of August, I was doing that. And then um, I made the decision, should I go back to school? And I was starting to feel pretty, pretty, pretty good by the end of August. So I said, okay, I'll go back to school. But um, what I wasn't aware of was it's the physical side and the cognitive. So when I went back to school and started doing work, things got way worse again. I was like back to, to the point of when it happened, it got really bad. And, and so then 
you're back in school, yep. but you're not mm -hmm. able to do a lot of things that yeah. you normally do in school. Focus is incredibly difficult. I mean, reading gave you gave me headaches. You made me you know, blurry, dizzy. Um, I couldn't sit in a class for 20 minutes. It just wasn't wasn't possible. I mean, and and how did how did your teachers react to that? And how did your friends react to that? Well, the um, the biggest, the hardest thing is that with you know, a broken arm, you have cast or you have crutches if you hurt your leg or knee. But with concussion, you don't have any you know, obvious signs that you're hurt. So people go, well, what do you mean you can't come play hockey tonight? Or what do you mean you can't do this? And I go, like, I can't. And they go, why not? You know, they, they, they can't tell. They don't know. So that's the most difficult part is telling people, you know, I can't do this when they think you can because you look fine when you're not fine. And how long did this last? Um, it was about till early November. I was in, uh, I was starting to feel pretty, pretty bad. So um, my uncle actually was at the Health and Performance Center, and he said, "Why don't you go there? They have a whole concussion thing. You should check it out." So I went there and I saw Dr. Mountjoy, and she was basically even more. So you know, we just thought you shouldn't be in school at all. You shouldn't be doing any of this. So um, I ended up dropping a few classes and I didn't, I talked to a few of my teachers and didn't have to do any more work or anything that the rest of the semester and just started to go back to square one basically and relax and rest and do a bunch of that. And I was feeling pretty good again so I said, you know, I, I think I could do it. So I went back but I only took three courses again with reduced workload like I had. I had, I was on um, with student with disabilities and I had a bunch of treatment and special circumstances to help me out with that. And so where are things now? Now I feel, and this is this is 18 months after the fact. Yeah, so I ended up going back, and I started feeling pretty good again. And then, um, like last summer, I took two months off again. I didn't even work. I didn't do anything. I just relaxed, did nothing. Um, I worked last summer for the final two months, and I felt pretty good. And I finished up my school last semester, and I felt pretty good. And now I feel, I feel, I feel pretty good. I don't. I wouldn't say you know 100 percent, but probably the closest I've ever been. So that's good. You no, know, I still get headaches. I mean, I mean, people, everybody gets headaches, so that's kind of normal. But I can, I can tell when it's a, just a regular headache and when it's not. And sometimes you wake up and you have one, and that doesn't make any sense. And sometimes um, things just don't feel totally right. But I mean, they feel, they feel pretty good. I'd say for the longest time, I didn't feel like myself, and that's kind of hard thing to describe to people. I and mean, then, what do you mean you don't feel like yourself? And I just don't. But um, that's gone away. Like, I feel pretty back to normal, so that's good. Samantha Kosakowski. And maybe if you could move down just a little bit, Clayton. Hi, Samantha. Nice to meet you. And Samantha is a 20-year-old soccer player for the University of Guelph women's team, and you sustained your concussion last September. Yeah. And why don't you tell your story? All right. Um, we went up to Windsor for a travel weekend, Western Windsor. Um, it was a cold, rainy, haily type day. Was not looking forward to playing in this cold. So it was about the 25th minute. I was a, I'm a defensive player, so I went up for a ball. And then there, there's this girl, six foot three maybe, up behind me. So I'm like, I'm, I have no chance of getting this ball. We go up for the header. She heads the back of my head, so right the left side under my ponytail. And I fell to the ground, and the ref continued to let the game play. And all I remember is hearing one of my teammates, ref, come on, it's a head injury. What are you doing? So then he called the game, and I'm just rolling around. I'm like a little disoriented, don't really know what's going on. I get up, I shake it off, I'm fine, I've been hit before. So I keep playing the next 20 minutes or so. We go back to the team room for half time. I'm just, feel nauseous, sick to my stomach, dizzy, blurred vision. My coach comes up to me, he's like, are you sure you can go back on? I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. He's like, why don't you take a seat? We'll, we'll bench you for the game. I was like, okay, here we go. So little did I know that was gonna be the onset for the rest of my season. So that night we were staying in a hotel. All I wanted to do was go home. I was tired, I was sore, I didn't feel myself. Everything was a blur. So then when we finally came back to Guelph, I went to the family or the on-campus doctor and he said, well, you have a concussion. I'm like, okay, hey, great. What is this gonna do for my season? He's like, why don't you just take a few weeks off? We'll monitor you every week and we'll see how it goes. It is February 18th, 19th now, and I am still not cured. And so what's, as you said, you, you don't feel yourself, and it's what Clayton said as well. Um, what's not yourself? What are you feeling these days that isn't yourself? Well, I've always been an upbeat, happy-go-lucky person, and nowadays I have no motivation to do anything. 
I don't want to go to school. I don't want to get out of bed. I am in pretty much, you can call it a depression, I guess. Um, I went to go see my family doctor, and he did say that I do have a mild depression because of this concussion because I'm not living my normal life. I'm used to soccer seven days a week, three hours a day. I can't play soccer. I can't go out with, I can't have a social life. So all I do is get up, go to school, come home, and do nothing. So that's really the definition of not being myself. Right. And how about the school part of it, the, the academic part of it? Um, I was a very stubborn person, so I did my readings, I went to all of my classes, like my physiotherapist even said, oh, you should probably drop a class, like maybe take four classes, and I was like, no, no, I can handle it because I didn't want to be behind, I didn't want the added pressure and stress, so I took the five classes, and let's just say it didn't go as I wanted it to. So where are things now for you, and yeah, what, what, um as, as you approach um, the rest of this year, what are you feeling? Well, I went to go see a neurologist, and he pretty much gave me the speech of, you suffered a severe concussion, and you have either one of two decisions. You continue to play the game, you risk another head injury, brain damage for life, or you hang up your cleats and you call it a retirement. So what I have right now is one of the biggest decisions I've ever had to make in my life either quit the game that I love more than anything in the world or risk serious permanent brain damage. For those of you who are going through the concussion, um, this is advice that I got from one of my teammates. She, she sustained seven concussions and is still playing the game. Um, you can't let yourself be down. You can't leave yourself in the darkness. You have to get out, be with your friends, do the routinely activities that you do, or else you will lose sight of yourself. You will fall into a depressive state. Just you have to keep going on with your life because life does go on. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Claire Kelterborn. And Claire is 11 years old and plays hockey for the Guelph Thunder Pee Wee A's and sustained a concussion at the end of September and just returned to play about three weeks ago. Claire, can you tell us your story? Um, well, I was um, playing... Um, in September, and it was just um, our exhibition games. And a girl came from behind me, and I didn't really know what happened. I just remember kind of opening my eyes and looking up at the arena ceiling. And um, I, I tried to lift up my head, and I was getting really bad headaches and pains in my neck. So I just stayed down, and my trainer came out to me, and we just went and left right to the dressing room. And um, so I just got undressed slowly, and I was actually with my grandma because my parents were um, somewhere else. So I, we went home, and we just rested. And then um, I went to school the next day, and I couldn't concentrate. The lights and noise were really bothering me. So I stayed home for a couple of days, and I went to um, a doctor, Dr. Galvin's office. And so she said that I did have a concussion, so I, um, I had to rest for a a long time, and um, the headaches, they, um, they just didn't stop. And, and what was resting to you? What, um, I, what um, resting? Well, I couldn't watch any TV, use any electronics, or um, I just couldn't do a lot of activity, really. Even going on short walks gave me pretty bad headaches, so I would basically, um, no reading at all either. And, and are these headaches different from headaches that you would have had before in your life? Um, yeah, I um, noticed that a lot of my headaches were um, short, sharp pains in my head, and they would only last for a couple of seconds, but they would be repeated. And, and how long did all of this continue? Um, well, I, um, a couple of months, actually. And I had injured my neck. I had whiplash, so that was contributing to the headaches. Um, and um, it, I had done a con like a concussion test uh, that I had done before my season started, and the results were okay, I guess. So I, I had just had to rest, basically. And, and you heard what, uh, uh, what was said before about the effect in terms of friends and school. Did you have similar experiences that way? Um, well, I did have to take a lot of time off of school. Well, a couple of days anyways, um, but... Um, I did notice that I was a little out of it. I guess it was hard to focus sometimes in school, uh, but it didn't really affect and like my friends or anything, my attitude really. 
And, and, and now you're feeling entirely better? Yeah, I am. I feel like I'm back to myself because I started playing hockey again, so it's good to be back with my friends on my hockey team. And is there anything that you can't do now or, and or you've chosen not to do now at this stage? Well, I, um, I'm, since I'm completely back, I just try and stay away from anything that um, could really hit me in the head. Like if I was playing soccer or something, I wouldn't go goalie. I don't want to. So just try and stay away from things that could potentially give me another concussion. And, uh, and so, so far as you're concerned now that it's, it's full steam ahead, and, uh, and you're hoping and expecting that that will all just continue for you. Yeah. And is there anything that we haven't talked about that I've, uh, that I've missed? I don't think so. Oh, very good. Well, thanks a lot, Claire. Um, Sarah Van Norman. And Sarah is uh, 32 years old. She's a skier, a mountain biker, a triathlete, and uh, believe it or not, she's involved in roller derby. <laughs> not anymore. <laughs> and uh, who had... You know, sure. um, First in concussion, you believe, in a ski race crash about three years ago. Yeah. The floor is yours. Well, you know, you were talking about um, adolescence being at a stage where you feel invincible and, and just carrying on. Um, it seems really obvious now that the last three years have been uh, full of head traumas for me, but it really didn't feel like it at the time. Um, yeah, I had a bad ski crash, and I also had whiplash. Um, I, at the time, was a young executive director, and I had a very short period of time off to recover. So, you know, you pick up your socks and you keep going, and um, I, uh, that was sort of the first um, episode, and, and sort of over the, la uh, over the next six months. But just to interrupt you, I mean, how could you have been experiencing, as you described it, head trauma, but not know it? Um, I had a really stressful job, and I thought I had tension headaches, and um, I've always been an athlete, and, you know, I'm used, to, I, I played rugby, um, I'm, I'm used to feeling my body hurt, um, and it was inconvenient to, to really try and figure out what was going on. Um, I lived by myself, so it, it wasn't um, as if there was someone around saying, oh, you know, you've this is the fourth headache this week or anything like that. So um, the next six months after that, sort of things kind of slowly started to go downhill and I started playing roller derby as a stress outlet. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. that might be a symptom right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was really fun. Um, it, it's a really social sport. Um, it, it's a lot of uh, physical release and it's a demanding game and um, so I started playing roller derby and uh, my my whiplash injury sort of left me um, vulnerable to more head traumas I didn't know at the time again um, and I thought I was still just uh, getting tension headaches stress headaches I, I live I lived in Squamish and I was commuting to Vancouver every day and you know there was a lot going on I was simultaneously doing my PhD so it just seemed kind of normal um, and, uh, so anyway, so I... But you were able to do all of that. Yeah, and, and the, way, the way that I see it is sort of over the last three years, it's sort of been in decline, and I feel like it's sort of just, um, every day was just keeping my head above water. And things became less efficient, my work became much less efficient. I stopped doing my work on my PhD to, because I just needed to focus solely on my job. And, um, and anyway, so, um, so this past summer I was mountain biking uh, with my derby friends and um, by that time our, my doctors think that uh, my concussion sim symptoms had um, degraded my balance and my vestibular system to a point where um, I was making uh, errors in, in my reaction that I, I normally wouldn't. So. Uh, we were on a simple trail, and I went over my handlebars. Um, I cracked my helmet, and we all laughed. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I have a loss of memory about that specific incident, but um, that didn't seem to be um, too much of an issue. You know, I'm, I crashed with a bunch of girls that I usually, you know, are in contact with. So 
I finished the ride, and all I could think at the end of my ride was, man, I have to buy a new helmet. I cracked my helmet. Um, and how long ago was this? That was August. Okay. Um, I had a headache for two days. I had huge sensitivity to light um, and sound. I had nausea, and, you know, that's when the really... Everything all together was the really classic symptom. I went to um, my family doctor, and uh, he referred me to a specialist in Whistler, and that sort of started everything. Um, I did concussion protocol. I felt really good for a month. I did the Spartan race uh, in Squamish in September. Uh, that was okay, so I was able to return to play. I didn't, at the time, realize that my concussion history was so long. Um, I thought it was just the bike accident. Um, so anyways, I, I, I did the Spartan, and then um, I went to a roller derby practice, and I got checked from behind. A girl was falling by accident, um, which happens. And, uh, and right away, I had symptoms again. So that sort of started on this process. My parents live in Cambridge, so I was moved home because I couldn't do anything like everybody else. So you've been home how long now? Um, Mom stayed with me for a month in Squamish, and uh, so I've been home since the end of November. And what does today feel like? Uh, pretty tough. Yeah, my Brett is my physiotherapist, and we've been doing great work, and in a way that's been a, a lifesaver with my massage therapist. Um, getting the physicality back in my life is, is really important, but... I don't feel like myself. Um, my studies are on hold. Um, I, yeah, I, I don't feel uh, like I have the confidence or the intelligence that I, I did once. It's such an interesting phrase that almost all of you have used with, a, you know, I don't feel myself. And I can remember it and at that conference that Margot was mentioning uh, in Zurich. Um, so many of the, of the people there the way they would diagnose somebody first would be a phrase almost exactly that, except it would be the other person's perspective saying that he doesn't look like himself. And, and that, you, that you don't really, you don't have a checklist to say, well, uh, you know, the skin's a little paler or this or that. It's just the overall impression, this person doesn't look like themselves. And that is the strongest indication that they aren't themselves in, in some way. Something isn't quite right you know, in it. So um, where, uh, you know, that, that as you imagine yourself um, six months from now, a year from now, where are you, what are you doing, um, what are you thinking of these days? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't... Um... I don't have the concentration right now to complete my PhD. Um, I, I've left my job. Um, I'm 32 years old, and I, and I don't know what the next step is for me, and that's really, really tough. I'm trying to see it as an opportunity. Um, and on good days, I can. Um, but but I, I, really, I really don't know. I hope, I hope that I can keep getting better physically, and it's the emotional part that, you know, is the next. And is there anything, just as I uh, asked the others, is there anything that we haven't talked about that, that I've missed and that you should be saying? I don't know. I just, I, I guess the theme is, you know, I, I think I'm a relatively intelligent person. Um, and for, for three years, I, I really, it was a misdiagnosis. You know, when I started to struggle, my family doctor in Squamish, um, you know, very rightly, you know, thought that, I had an anxiety depression issue, and most likely I did, but it was caused by something else. So um, he put me on something for that that actually masks pain as well. Um, so it's just the message from me is that, you know, you really have to listen to yourself. Thanks, Sarah. And Ryan is a 20-year-old player uh, in, the, in the Guelph Storm organization who suffered his first concussion January 1st, 2011 when called up from Listowel to play for the Storm, uh, which wasn't really very good timing. No. <laughs> uh, so basically, I get called up to play for the Storm. I'm all excited. Um, obviously really excited to go play. And 
late in the third period, about a minute left to play. The Bucks get stumped into their end. I'm coming around the net. There, the Sudbury defenseman comes and hits me. My head, he, he hits my head, my head hits the glass. Um, I fall to the ice. I kind of look up, not really sure where I am, kind of dazed. So I start skating back to the bench, um, just sit on the bench. The game's over. I go in. I, I tell Lori, she's our trainer, that I'm fine, I'm feeling OK, obviously, because I'm one of those players that I don't like to say that I'm hurt if I can play and if I know I can play. So she kind of did the, the couple tests that you require to take when you get hit to the head. She said I was, I was looking fine. I felt, I felt fine. I didn't feel like totally myself, like totally perfect, but I figured it would go away, just a quick headache. So later that night, we're driving. I'm driving to dinner with the team. I, the lights, the, the bright lights are kind of getting in my head. I, everything's kind of dizzy. I have dinner. Uh, I talk to Lori there at the dinner and say, hey, something's wrong. I have big headaches. I'm, I'm getting dizzy. The lights are bothering me. So we took the, the next steps that you need to take for concussions. The next day, I, the concussions got worse. The back of my head was just pounding. Um, so I went to the doctors. The doctors diagnosed me with a concussion. So I basically took a week off, didn't go to school, didn't, didn't do anything really, just slept in my bed, went downstairs and kind of sat in the dark room on the couch. Um, took the steps that I needed to do. So I missed about three weeks. And after the three weeks, I took the steps that you need to take to get back in. So you do the, the walking, and then you take 24 hours. Then you start biking, and then you can start your practicing, and then all that kind of stuff. A year passes, and this year in November, playing against Sarnia, and I get hit, a blindside hit to the head. The, the face-off, I was coming up the middle of the ice. I didn't have the puck. I was looking at my one of my, my forwards with me. And I get hit to the head. I don't remember what happened on the hit until I saw the video replay after, but I do remember falling to the ice, trying to get up three, three or four times, couldn't stand up. But eventually I got up, skated to the bench, and went right to the dressing room, did the tests I had to do, diagnosed with a concussion again, and I missed two weeks for that one. And when was that? How, how long ago was that? That was in November. That was in November. Yeah. So where are things today? Things, I, f I feel 100% now, no headaches, no nothing, just obviously it takes a couple, couple of weeks after you, you're fully healed to kind of be the, the player that you usually are. So like going to the corners, kind of taking hits, giving hits, but now I'm 100%. You, you feel like yourself now. Yeah. yeah. And, 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 and in no other activities that you're doing where you might have to focus and have stress and have to concentrate, uh, none of those things are triggering anything either. No, nothing, nothing really bothers me. I can, I've taken courses at University of Guelph. Uh, we practice every day, so things like that, workouts, everything I'm fine with. And in terms of, of as you approach the future as, as a player, um, do you, um, are, are you imagining how, like, I mean, in the instances where you had your concussions, was there, was there any way of, of making those plays differently where, in fact, uh, you might have been less vulnerable uh, but still able to be as effective in making the play as you need to be if you're going to be a player? Yeah, the first one, um, the, just the puck goes behind the net. I should have been more aware that there was a defenseman coming and maybe protecting myself a little bit better. But the second hit, I had no idea. I was just, it was a blindside hit. I didn't, the puck was nowhere near me. I didn't have it, so I couldn't have uh, protected myself any better than that. And is there anything that we haven't talked about tonight that, uh, that I've missed? Uh, just basically taking time to, uh, to get better. Don't lie to yourself. Say, hey, I'm, I'm feeling better, even though if you aren't feeling better. Uh, take the time off because it's, uh, it's better for you in the long run. So I think that with me taking time off and doing the proper steps, that's what's got me back to being 100% both times. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. And the last of our athletes is Colleen Scott. And Colleen is a 17-year-old ringette player uh, and who suffered a concussion on November the 2nd. Colleen, tell us about your experiences. 
Um, well, I've been playing competitive ringette for 12 years of my life, and I've never had any injuries or anything until November 2nd. We were in a tournament in Oshawa, and a girl on the opposing team came up from behind me and took my feet out from underneath me, which caused me to land on my tailbone. Um, I'm pretty sure I blacked out from that impact because I don't remember hitting my head, but the entire arena heard me hit my head on the ice, so I trust them. Um, I didn't feel any immediate sim symptoms, so I continued the remainder three minutes of the game, um, and it wasn't until I was off the ice and my adrenaline had calmed down that I started to feel a little emotional and like my pupils started to dilate a bit. Um, and then, like, the next few days at school, I was getting unnecessary headaches, and I was getting fatigued and tired by, like, last period. I couldn't take it anymore. And about three days after my concussion, um, I was diagnosed by my doctor that it was a concussion, and she told me just to stop living and stop school and stop sports and just take a break stop living yeah <laughs> <laughs> and, and so how long like and, and so you shut down school you shut down outside of activities you stayed home uh, and at home you shut down normal home things that you might have watching television or listening to music or yeah for the beginning I could handle quiet music um, I couldn't do any electronics or anything I would spend my days just in the house. I would color sometimes, I could handle that. Um, and that seemed to be going okay for the first few days, but my symptoms kept occurring and they were getting worse over the course of about three weeks. I was getting dizzy and head pressures and sensitivity to light and noise. And things weren't just getting better and like through that period I just, yeah, it was just hard to cope. And, and again, that lasted how long, about? Three weeks. And then what started to change? Um, by about the fifth week, I could feel a slow turnaround coming. Um, I still wasn't 100% for sure. It took a long time to get back to my normal. Um, I was off school for about two months. So... Um, and what did that mean in terms of your courses, your teachers, your friends? Um, the school was really great and understanding and just not putting any pressure on me to finish my courses and it was just totally at my pace what I could handle. I did manage to get three out of four of my credits with decent marks which I'm grateful with and when I returned to school after Christmas I still had a few symptoms so I had to wear sunglasses for the lights and earplugs just to minimize the noise and chaos of the school, which helped a lot. And I was on a, um, a like adjusted academic plan, which helped a lot to get my credits continued by finished up by the end of the semester. And and right now, how are you feeling? Um, right now, I'm feeling good. I just completed the return to play process and had my t first practice on Saturday, which went really well. So it's exciting to be back on the ice and just with my team again. And in terms of other activities, school and the rest of it, you're basically into a normal routine now? Yep, school's feeling good. And, um, uh, and looking back on the experience, um, what's different about you? I mean, how, what have you learned? What, uh, what will you take with you into the future? Well, um, I for sure, like, because when I was getting better and I was almost back, I was observing and watching the games, and for sure, for, from a game aspect, I can understand the game better because I was seeing it from a different perspective, and I can kind of understand where I should be on the ice and to how I, like, improve my game and just make sure the accident doesn't happen again. And one of the hardest things was just, like, the isolation that it was kind of feeling because it's hard for people who aren't going through it to understand what you are feeling and as much as they try it's just it's a it's a lonely process sometimes uh, and, are, and are you are you used to lonely 
No, I I like social, like my, with my Marriott team and everything. I'm usually around people a lot, and I do like alone time, but it's nice to be social too. Anything that we haven't talked about? Um, yeah, one of the most important things I think is just to make sure you take enough time off with your concussion and don't rush back into your activities and even like school, just like take it off and just take a break from life because that's really what will help the healing process. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And thanks to all of you um, that um, I, uh, I, again, I've, I've done this a couple of times before and um, usually the, the most profound impact uh, on the audience is from people who have had concussions telling just what it was like. And that the, you know, the rest of us read about it in a newspaper and we see where somebody is out for two weeks, three weeks, uh, and out. You know, that, but what, what does out mean? Well, we don't really quite know except we don't see them on a television screen for that period of time. But to, to come to start to understand what out means in terms of the rest of one's life, and what you've done is you've 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 set up the discussion. You know, that is that is that you know that we we know now why we're here. We know the implications of this question, and now it's that opportunity to talk to people who are working on it and to see what they are doing, and to see where things are. But thank you for telling us all about it. I know for it's not that easy at times. Uh, but I think that you have done all of us a real service by, by telling what it has all felt like. Thank you. So our next group, the doctors and return to, to uh, play people, uh, to speak about their experiences in treating concussions, what, it, what a concussion is, its symptoms and effects, the consequences of repeated concussions, what we know and don't know, and, and so on. Joining us, first of all, is Dr. Laura Purcell. Laura is a pediatric support medicine physician involved at all levels of sports from local to the 2010 Vancouver Olympics and associated with the David Braley Sports Medicine and Rehabilitation Center at McMaster. Laura. Mm -hmm. Dr. Margot Mountjoy. Margot is a sport medicine physician, member of the IOC Medical Commission and assistant clinical professor at McMaster School of Medicine and is a retired uh, international level synchronized swimmer. Margot. Um, Lori Stevenson is an athletic therapist for the storm and you heard Lori referred to uh, earlier on by, by Ryan. Lori. And Brent Lyons is a physiotherapist and a driving force in the Health and Performance Center's Concussion Management Program. Thanks. You heard um, six athletes, some of whom you know, some of whom you have treated, um, uh, but just, if you can just start out by reacting to what you have heard. I think the biggest thing for me is listening to all of their stories and how so many of them were so similar because the thing that's so hard about concussions is every athlete presents differently, every athlete ha experiences different symptoms and every athlete is out for a different length of time and, and has an overall different experience. So in listening to their stories, there were a lot of them that experienced some of the same symptoms, but they've all been out for such a different period of time. So I, I think it's recognizing that everybody is different and you have to kind of listen to yourself. And I know a couple of them said it is listening to your body and realizing that, yeah, you're not right because you know your body the best. So it's easiest for you to tell us when you're feeling back to normal. 
Well, for me, it's a little bit different because I, see, I don't see anyone above 17 years of age. So for a lot of my patients, I rely heavily on what the parents tell me in terms of how they assess the normality or abnormality of their child at that time. Um, and particularly with younger children, they're not as able to voice how they're feeling. Um, Claire actually was very, very good at describing how she feels. But for some younger children, they're just not able to communicate how they're feeling. And it may just come out as, I don't feel right, or they're just behaving differently than they normally do. So in the younger age groups, it's even more difficult to diagnose uh, concussion than in older um, athletes who are able to tell you somewhat of how they're feeling. And, and, and what is it like when, when you're hearing a parent be the, the witness uh, um, and, and telling about their child being hurt? Is it, are, are, are they good witnesses? That's a loaded question. Uh, <laughs> That's why I asked. Uh, <laughs> um, it can sometimes be difficult to sort out how they feel about it as opposed to what they're witnessing. Uh, so sometimes the parents, their anxiety about the child can, o can sort of overshadow the objective uh, impression of what's going on. Um, most parents are very good at saying, my child is more tired than normal, um, they're more irritable than normal, they're not uh, interacting the same way as they normally do. Some parents are so anxious and over cautious that uh, they can sometimes be overprotective and actually correct the child when the child says, I'm actually feeling better, and they're saying, no, you're not. Um, so it can be hard to sort out, is it the child or the parent who has a more objective or realistic view of how they're feeling? And does it sometimes work the other way as well, of where uh, a, a parent will um, regard less, um, I mean, with the, that, that he, he's fine, he'll be, he'll be okay. Yep, you get that, that range of the spectrum as well. Uh, and you also get the parents who are like, no, you got to get out and play. Uh, you got to get back. Um, I find that less and less with more uh, people being aware of concussion and the repercussions of, of undiagnosed concussions or mismanaged concussions. I'm finding that less and less, but you still see it. And so if you have, if you're dealing with young kids that, that often uh, have a hard time expressing how they feel, and if you have in their place adults or their parents that can either, either under express or over express, what do you do? How do you, how do you see through all of that and decide how that child is? Well, that's when Laurie's comment about knowing the athlete. Um, so I try never to make a decision on the first visit. I try to see them over a period of time and see how they are they're changing over a period of time. And sometimes um, it's not a tangible thing that you can quantify or say, this is better or this is better. Um, it's just how they look. Um, it's, an, it's an untangible quality of just, they look better. And you can't say specifically what it is, uh, but they- Sometimes it's just a sparkle in their eye. Yep, or the color in their cheeks. That you think, wow, yep. you, look, you, look, you look okay now. Yeah. I've treated a, a lot of these athletes and, and when they come to see me, they have a mandate to return to play. And so one of the things that I see is that they're trying to, not in, not in all cases, but try and, and mask things and convince themselves that they're feeling fine and that they're ready to go back to play. And one of the things that came out um, that I was probably surprised about was the commonality of them saying, I wish that there was some way for me to tell people what was wrong with me, that there was some sort of uh, external way for me to show how I'm feeling inside. Um, you know, I've had a couple people say, like, can I put a brace on or something like that? Because people think that I'm normal and they treat me normal, but I'm not normal. We have to remember that this is a traumatic brain injury. It's on the mild, it's on the mild uh, uh, span of it, but it still is a traumatic brain injury. And I mean, all of you have, or at least most of you, have, have talked about how, um, you know, that, that you can tell in a look now. How long did it take you to trust yourself in that way? Uh, you know, that's, that's not, it doesn't seem very scientific, and you're science people. And yet, you know, that's what you're, you're deciding in the end. Um, 
So how long has it taken for you to trust yourself? Well, that's what we call the art and science of medicine. Um, so it's not all science. Um, a lot of what we do is art and experience. And I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm still learning things about concussion every day. Almost every patient that I see teaches me something new about concussion. And it might not necessarily change what I do, but I think about what I do a lot more. So I wouldn't say I'm ever 100%. Um, I'm fairly comfortable most of the time, but I, I'm still learning everything, uh, something new just about every time I see a new patient with a concussion. Can, can you give an example of, of something that, you know, you look back and you sort of say, how could I not have understood that a year ago? I've been seeing all kinds of people, and this person is basically saying what a hundred others have said before, but now I'm actually taking it in a certain way and I've learned something that was there to have been learned before and now I pick it up. I mean, do you have any examples of that? For me, I had an experience last year where I had an athlete who, it was a fairly innocent hit in front of the net, whiplash, and he ended up with a concussion, but I let him go back to play the game and when I, um, when I looked back at it, he was a player that kind of, he always sat on the bench and he cheered his teammates on every time he was on the bench. And when I looked back at this game after he came and saw me the next day, I, I kind of said, you know what? Like right after that hit, he sat on the bench and wasn't watching the play, wasn't focusing on, on what was going on in the ice. And I said, that right there should have been my sign that I shouldn't have had him playing because his behavior was always the type to cheer his teammates on, was always really into the game, and all of a sudden he couldn't care less what was going, out on, going on out on that ice because of what was going on in his head. I mean, we've talked a lot about just the, you know, the, the look of somebody. And so when somebody uh, makes an appointment and shows up at your office... Uh, and, and, and you may not have seen them before. Uh, you don't know them. You know what you see. Um, um, how do you make your initial determination? And they had used this, the, the people there had used this phrase before as a bit of a reference, but not being a guideline. And the phrase was, when in doubt, sit them out. And this time they were really talking about it as a guide. Um, how do you deal with somebody new that way, coming to see you in an office? As you say, you know, they want to play, they want to get back to playing, and what do you do? We're trained as physicians on how to assess concussion, and we have sport concussion assessment tools that we use, um, which is part of history, physical examination, but also talking to family members as to how the athlete is doing. So we, we do employ those, those tools. But I think what's, in, what's really important is just getting a sense of who this person is and how they think they're doing and what they're, what it, how it impacts the rest of the life. How are they doing at school? How are they doing at home? And how are they doing it socially? And I think that's, that's kind of how we, we look after things in our office. But what you're absolutely right about the guidelines in terms of when in doubt sit them out. Four years ago, we thought there were certain populations of elite athlete at certain levels with certain support could play on the same day, return to play same day. And the guidelines from this concussion conference, which will be published in March, um, were very clear. Head injury, do never return on the same day. And when in doubt, sit them out is now a clear guideline. What I think was also very exciting for me at this most recent conference is um, how do we manage the chronic long-term concussion? The most concussions, and I'd like to make this very clear, they resolve within seven days quite nicely with just expectant care. And by far the majority of what we see do respond quite nicely within one to two weeks. It's the examples that we heard tonight that last longer and take longer that, that worry us and make us think. And that's what we're learning more about and what we hope to learn in the next years about as research comes is how do we help these people return to life, return to school, return to meaningful sport activity as they recover from their brain injury. And are, are, you, um, are you getting better at, um, when somebody does come in to see you, uh, of figuring out you know, that this person, chances are they'll, you know, that 
they'll be back in a week or two weeks. Um, this one might be longer. But, uh, certain things do sort of uh, possibly predict prolonged recovery. So more severe symptoms, greater number of symptoms, um, symptoms that are getting worse when they're trying to do just normal day-to-day -day things like watching TV, um, uh, computer work, if they're unable to get back to school within a couple of days, uh, those are signs that more than likely they're going to have uh, prolonged recovery. Um, other predictors are if they have other health conditions like learning disabilities, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, uh, mental health issues like anxiety or depression, um, or if they've had multiple previous history uh, concussions, and particularly if the previous concussions have had prolonged recovery those may point to prolonged recovery with the current injury. When they're going through their return to play phase and when they're um, exerting themselves for the first time, um, or if you see them on the bench for any trainers or coaches, um, because if you ask if they're fine, everyone's fine. Um, I think it's important to ask specific questions and I think we're getting better at teasing out what those questions are to figure out who has a concussion and who doesn't. Looking back on my career when I started as a physiotherapist, I did a lot of sports coverage on, on the sidelines and I, I know that I missed a lot of concussions and I know that I just didn't follow the, the, the players right and I know that they weren't acting properly. But I was a, I was a new physiotherapist and I let the coaches bully me around quite frankly. <laughs> And I know that there was a lot of players that had concussions that went back to play right away. I can think of one specific example of uh, I, was, I was working with a football team and uh, the one guy got hit. He, he got rocked. And he, um, he came off and he was a little bit woozy. I said, are you fine? He looked at me. He said, I'm fine. I asked like three questions. I said like, where are we today? what's the score, what's the quarter? And he answered them right, and I thought, and the coach was in my ear saying, he's gotta get back on, he's on special teams, we need him, go, 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 go. And I said, I don't think he's right to do this. And so I took his helmet away from him, and I didn't hide it well enough. <laughs> <laughs> and before I knew it, I turned because, uh, one of the other players had an ankle injury or something like that, and I was looking after him. And before I knew it, he had grabbed his helmet, put it on, ran back onto the field. After the game, he couldn't, uh, they were supposed to all put their jerseys into the center so that they could get washed and everything like that. He threw his into the garbage. And he was like, he was a fourth year player. You know, it was, it, it was completely out of context for him. And, those sorts of things, I think if I had been asking the right questions at that point, that I certainly, I definitely wouldn't have let him play again, for sure. That coach that you described that was in your ear, do you think that if you were on the sidelines this fall and uh, the same sort of thing happened, would that coach be still in your ear or have things changed somewhat, at least in that regard over this time? I mean, I, I, I think that that varies on, I mean, as we know, the, the spectrum of personalities of coaches is huge. So I, I think, I, I don't think that it would be the same as it was, um, but I would be a lot more, I would certainly advocate for my players a lot more. And the problem that I did was I put the, I put the value of the team ahead of the player. And the coach was pushing me, and I thought this is an important game and we need him, and that was wrong. I need to put the player above everything else, and now we have good, solid research to back that. What's the biggest thing that you don't know now and that, and that, and that you really, more than anything, want to know, and if you did know, you, it would make such a difference as to the work that you're doing. I think the biggest thing is using the resources that we do have. Um, like we have so many doctors here in Guelph that are working with Guelph minor hockey to help de like increase awareness and de decrease 
people going back too quickly. We've had, I know Guelph minor hockey requires impact testing now as a baseline at the start of the year. Like, use those resources. If you're unsure about a kid, the coaches know better than anybody how they play. Get the coaches on board and say, you know what, I'm not really sure how this kid is doing. Watch their play for me and, and, and help to let me know what's, like, if, if they seem off to you, we need to pull them from the game. And get your coaches on board at the start of the year, and then you're aware you guys are all on the same page. I think that's the big thing. I mean, historically, there might have been even more of a tension between a coach and a trainer. Uh, and what you're saying is, is no, you know, that we've come far enough now that we really are on the same page. We need to understand we're on the same page and act like we're on the same page. Exactly, yeah. One of the big things that I've learned is that there is stuff that we can do with, for people with concussions as well. Uh, vestibular training, there's uh, treatment for neck issues. Lots of headaches are caused by neck problems. Um, people that have had concussions for over a month now, there's research that's being generated that says that we can exercise them and that they can get better that way. So uh, taking a proactive approach to the treatment of concussions, I think, is a really exciting thing. I think what I'm learning about are the chronic, the long-standing um, concussions. The other ones, I've been doing this for 25 years, so I, I'm comfortable with the with the regular ones. It's the chronic ones that sometimes stump me as to how and what we should be doing. So that's what I want to be learning more about. What uh, I might have a slightly different focus um, with my work with the International Olympic Committee. One of the, my big jobs internationally is working with sport federations to change their rules, to change the rules in sport to make them safer. I've worked with the gentleman who got the rule change for FIFA. The elbow to the head is now a red card. And he's shown very significantly that the head injuries have gone down statistically significantly with the red card for the elbow to the head <coughs> in football, which is soccer outside of North America, FIFA. Um, we did some research this summer at the Olympic Games in London looking at head injuries in Taekwondo because the rules in Taekwondo are such that if you hit to the head with your foot, you get more points. So the more times you can hit your opponent in the head, the more likely you are going to win. So we are actually rewarding people for hitting in the head. And I'm not sure that's in the true spirit of how we want our athletes to be treated. So we're working with that sport to look at how we can change the rules to make it still an exciting event um, without putting our athletes' heads at risk. I work also with water polo and synchronized swimming in the Swimming Federation, and these both sports have high injuries of head, head injuries. Water polo in particular has the highest head injuries of all team sports at the Olympic Games. You might not think that, but their heads are above the water, and there's a lot of nasty business going on in water polo. I don't know if you've ever seen it underwater, but it's a really <coughs> exciting game. Uh, one thing that I've been focusing more on lately, or in the last couple of years, is particularly with my population, is that return to sport is actually secondary. It's return to school that has to be the focus. Uh, so return to learn should be the primary endpoint of concussion recovery and then secondarily uh, return to sport. Um, so educating the athletes and the parents um, that return to, to school, which is a student's main occupation, has to be the fo main focus. And once you're back to school and doing well there, then you look up going back to school, uh, sorry, to sport. The real lessons for anybody here, and especially parents, is that, is that it's so easy to be intimidated by this whole subject and to assume you know nothing. And, and in fact, you do know something that probably nobody else around the team knows. Not the coach, not the team's trainer, probably not even you know, the, the, your, your son or daughter's teammates. And that is, you know when your kid looks right and doesn't look right. And to trust that, because there's something there, you know, that it's, it doesn't look like scientific proof, but it's often the best information that anybody has. And, uh, and it's just been fascinating to listen to all of that. People who are involved in, uh, for the most part, hockey, but also with, with uh, soccer, and as 
coaches, managers, players, on-ice officials, off-ice officials, um, and basically who, you know, that, that, that hearing all of this, knowing all of this, um, they have within their hands, to a great extent, um, decisions. It's one of the things that, that's so difficult in this area is that, is that we would hope that, that science would be sort of at a level where, where science can make the decisions or the quality of equipment can make the decisions. But for the most part, decisions have to be made tomorrow, not a year from now, not five years from now, not 10 years from now. And those decisions are going to be decisions that are with imperfect information. And you're kind of doing the best you can. And the people who are the coaches, who are the league administrators and the rest, are those who are in the position where they have to make those kinds of decisions. And it's a really big challenge um, for them. Uh, Mike Kelly, uh, and Mike has been the GM of the Storm at two different occasions, uh, and scouting for Calgary and Carolina, and coaching and managing elsewhere in the OHL in between. Um, uh, Chris Height is an assistant coach with the Storm. Um, he's a former captain, played professionally uh, in the NHL, in North America, and in Europe. Is Sean Camp here? He was trying to make it. Oh, great, Sean. Sean is former head coach of the Sarnia Sting of the Storm and now the head coach of the, of the Griffins men's team. Um, Mike Gatto. Um, yeah, good. Mike Gatto is the chair of the GMHA concussion committee. Mike, thanks. Um, Dustin McCrank is an OHL referee. Rick Alsop, uh, and Rick is a GMHA referee. Ruben Flores is a former professional soccer player and is now technical director of Guelph Soccer. Thanks. I think I'm going to be probably off the... No, actually, I'm going to probably be off the stage. That's okay. And Dr. Lynn Woodford, uh, a representative of the Upper Grand District School Board, a, a psychologist consultant involved with students with concussions. And Robert Ferraro representing the, the Wellington Catholic District School Board. One of the challenges, I think, in all of this is, is in, in what directions do we go? Uh, that, that what are the most promising directions? And, and when I talk to hockey people, and, and it's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of a natural reaction, but the hope is that the answer will be in one of two places. And, and, and I think the hope is that it will be either in equipment, in better helmets, uh, uh, you know, softer um, elbow pads, shoulder pads, um, uh, that it will be in, in facilities. Um, uh, and, and, and the other hope is that the answer will be found in medicine. Uh, that in fact there will be a way of diagnosing and treating and so that in fact a concussion will become little more than uh, you know, a sprained ankle or, or something like that, and, and that we'll get to that point, and that that is, is that hope. Um, I think that from most of the doctors that I've talked to, people who are equipment people, facilities people, they would say that, in fact, the answer doesn't reside with us. That, that 5% of the answer, 10%, 15% of the answer resides with us tomorrow, a year from now, two years from now. But that, but that the largest part of the answer resides with what it is we do and how we play. If we were to be here five years from now or 10 years from now, what would have to happen for us to be able to say, those were a real good five years. You know, we really accomplish something in, in, in these five years and we... Ken, I think you've, uh, you know, touched on a couple of good things there in terms of maybe the answer is going to be in equipment, maybe it's going to be in medicine, um, but I think both of those answers are going to be long term. I think what we can control here and now, and we've seen a profound change, is the attitude towards concussions and the attitude towards concussion management. Um, I think you uh, said it with one of your other panelists there of 
treating the patient versus the player. Um, you know, Ryan's heard me say many times when we're in our uh, storm meetings and we're talking about our principles of success and you know what's important to us. And one of the things that I've always said is that we want to treat kids in our organization the way we want to treat our own children, in my case, my grandchildren uh, now. Um, but we all are competing, and it's competitive whether you're playing Adam AAA, whether you're playing uh, travel soccer, or whether you're playing in the Ontario Hockey League. But we do control the attitude of how we're going to treat the people that we're responsible for. And I think if we can keep that underlying value, you know, we're going to probably cut it by 30 or 40 percent, and we've take, taken huge steps. I think that it's a, a partnership between coaches, parents, if they're minor hockey players, uh, officials, and continuing, like Mike says, uh, to change behaviors and, and have players and, and coaches and parents understand what's acceptable and what's not acceptable, uh, what is a good hit and what's not a good hit, what causes it. I think that we have to continue. It's our responsibility as coaches, especially, to continue to educate our players about um, what is okay and what is not within the, within the games. Whether it's through uh, demonstration in practice, if you have the time to do it, or whether it's through video. We certainly see all the big bad hits in the NHL, um, but it's, it's on us to continue to educate players um, about what's okay and what's not. I think with the education too, it's it's educating the players on on certain things of of the symptoms. And I know, um, you know, golf minor hockey and, and different associations uh, around have taken steps to you know have baseline testing and and do to different protocol that that tests that, but also educates. And if you know, I remember Ryan getting hit in Sar against Sarnia, and you know, you could tell he was not himself and. And, you know, like Ryan said, he's the type of guy that wants to go out and play and wants to compete for his teammates. And, and you know, you're going to have kids like that, but um, it's important that you also give those guys that side of it at the start of the year, right? You, you tell them, you know what, it's not going to affect you. You know, it's not the macho thing here to, you know, come back. We know what type of uh, kids you are, that you want to be there for your teammates and, and you want to play. And, you know, as a coach and, and, and management, you have to express that to your players and say, listen, we know you guys love the game, or, or girls, we know that you guys want to play and, and, um, and contribute to your team, your teammates and your coaches and, and the town or whoever aren't going to think any less of you. And First of all, I want to thank you for the invitation. I want to thank uh, the people that invited us here, and I'm flattered to be here with this panel. I don't know them, but it, it sounds impressive. Um, <laughs> I play soccer. I come from a different country, and... Uh, this is awesome. I, I came here without knowing what to expect. The only thing that I thought it was, I'm going to learn something new. I'm going to hear something that I probably know, but maybe just uh, reinforce it. And uh, I can my, maybe share a couple of things that I, that I, that I have on my own. Uh, I know that in Canada, the, the main sport is hockey. And because of the nature of the sport, the concussions are, are, are more suitable to happen than on a soccer game, but I heard that the FIFA is changing. Uh, I was involved in some of the, the conversations about it, and, and, and it's going down, but it happens on soccer. But I think that the thing that I, I, I will bring for myself and for the responsibility that I have in Guelph soccer, I, I'm in charge of 4,000 kids at, on, on my club, I think that the thing that I'm gonna get the most out of it is, and, and the key word will be education. Uh, you were right on saying that we have to educate the players for sure about the symptoms, about the, the, the integrity, about the, the respect to the opposition. You touched a very good point at the beginning and you're right. Every single sport 50 years ago from now is completely different. And one of the things that I also want to, to, to think that we can uh, impact is educating. I see the room full of parents, professionals, uh, involved in many sports. And doing these kind of things will open the eyes of the people that can impact the sport that we are on. Uh, unfortunately, there's not too many people here from, from, from my sport. I see a couple faces. But uh, certainly, these opened my eyes. And I'm going to sit down and, and, and ask if we can have this chat in my club, bring a lot of people like this on a room, and, and have a conversation about it. Make them aware to educate them what it is, right? And the education, again, is not only to respect the boundaries of the sport. I'm thinking more on educating 
it's not about winning, although it's competing at the younger ages, it's not about winning. It's, it's sad to hear that there's an 11, a 15, a 17 year old kid that gets a concussion because they're competing, when thank goodness there's a movement in sports in Canada and they have this long-term player development speaking in all the sports. And I think that this is a good beginning to, to teach everybody, to educate everybody, that it's not about winning, right? It's taking care of, uh, for example, the kid that has the skills, teach him a good skill, and the kid that has a good skill, the player that has a good skill, then protect him with the rules, with equipment, with all these things, right? But um, the, the key word for me will be that education. The second part will be prevention. I'm thinking now myself, okay, we know what it is. We're learning every day. I didn't know as much as I know today after, number one, listening to the people that have concussions. Secondly, listen to the professionals that, that treat them. But how can we prevent it? And I'm gonna go back again into my area. And I think that if I do a good job in what I do, developing the player, teaching them skills rather than competing or winning at all costs, or having a big, strong player that can beat that skillful player because the rule allows him to do it. I don't think that that's right. One thing that, that, that disappointed me at the Zurich conference was that the, the, the principal voice um, um, of, of FIFA in terms of concussions, they, he was talking exclusively, I mean, if not exclusively, almost exclusively about as Margot mentioned, uh, in the air, the elbows, and the rest. And nothing in terms of, of heading the ball and the frequency of heading and the early age and the rest of it. And I think maybe that FIFA guy was misleading himself in terms of heading and, and basically saying that um, I can't even think about heading because it is so central to the way in which we play that once I start thinking about heading, it would so end up changing the game and I'm sorry, I can't get there. Well, that's what we're thinking about in all of these, you know, in all of these sports. I mean, if football doesn't reimagine how it plays, it has a very shaky future. And, and, and hockey needs to think about a lot of the ways in which Hockey is played as well, but some sports are not very ready to do that, and I'm not sure that I saw very much from FIFA in Zurich. There was a conference at the Ontario Soccer Association where uh, the national team coach from Chile came, and he, he said, if we want to succeed on the next World Cup, the one that was playing in Canada, we have to work on the heading aspect. And, he said, and everybody started talking about concussions, all the Canadian people were aware, and what are you going to throw the ball to, what age, how old, and, and he was aware of that. And he said, uh, and for all those people that are thinking, how did I do it, how we do it, and what do we propose, is that instead of throwing a ball and hitting it and getting the force of the ball hitting the head, why don't you hang it? When you touch the ball, there's no resistance, and the technique will be the same one. And he proposed a couple of things that people were like, oh, wow. So there's ways to do it, and I have to agree with you that because he's the biggest sport in the world, they don't want to change. They have to change at some point. And so both Upper Grand and uh, Wellington Catholic are here tonight to talk to you about where we're at in terms of our policy. Uh, we're implementing a concussion protocol policy in both boards, which will include uh, awareness, education, the uh, return to play, and most importantly, the return to learn uh, components uh, of the protocol. We're excited because we've heard, uh, although we've heard challenging things this evening, we, we've heard some very important and strong messaging that we would like to uh, include in our goals. Short term, what we're looking at, uh, first and foremost, when we roll out our policy, is to inform and educate parents and students, as well as faculty and our volunteer coaches, so everyone involved. And then we, we had a discussion around, well, maybe just the, the faculty that coach, but it's just as important to, to recognize that any one of our teachers tomorrow morning could have a student walk into their classroom with post-concussion symptoms. It might be a, a student uh, athlete. It may not even be a student athlete. Believe it or not, in our little schoolyards, we get a lot of bumps and bruises out there sometimes too. So our first goal is to educate everyone which will involve training of all faculty um, and volunteer coaches. It will also involve um, educating our parents 
and all of our students. And it'll, it'll include a communication piece as well so that we're informed at the school level, administration is informed of any one of our kids coming in with a concussion, whether they're an athlete or not. I think for us, uh, we discussed it with our team, um, changing that culture of you know, winning at all costs, that culture of um, having our, our athletes, or maybe in some cases parents, not being fully, um, not fully disclosing uh, <laughs> symptoms. We heard from Ryan and it was refreshing to hear. He said, be true to yourself. And if we could educate our students, most importantly, to know the symptoms and, and the long-term effects that concussions could, uh, could uh, create, it's important that we create that culture of erring on the side of caution versus erring on the side of competition and the pressure to perform. So that's our long-term goal. So it's really exciting for me to see over the a decade and a bit, that it's gone from saying, no, you can't have any effects of a concussion, to acknowledging that concussions can have really significant effects, and the importance of treating concussions properly from the beginning. And our kind of motto in our board is rest, 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 rest. And that we're really trying to get that message out there, that your brain is important. <laughs> it's important for learning. It's important for your whole life. And so when you have a concussion or any kind of a brain injury, you need to rest and take the time. And I was really happy to hear all the people who were talking about their experiences, how that was their advice that they would give to other people, is saying, take the time you need to really get better, because that's what all the research shows. And a lot of the concussions that we see in the board are not necessarily um, sports related, they may be motor vehicle accidents or other things, so to be aware outside the athletic realm of also the importance of dealing with injury. I've been on the board for about the last, well, for the last year, year and a bit, and one of the roles that was given to me was to, uh, well, the first, very first role that was given to me was to phys facilitate getting the players um, that are involved in contact in our organization, so that's minor peewee rep all the way up to major midget uh, rep um, to do the impact baseline testing. Um, so that for me, that chore for me started in July uh, this summer. It was approximately 345 athletes that are involved in that uh, impact testing. Um, what I found in trying to get that task done was that it was difficult. Um, I didn't have a lot of people readily wanting to do the test and it, I, I don't really know why, uh, but it was a struggle. It took me three months, um, even to this point. I never did get 100% compliance in, in athletes doing the test. Um, I'm at what, what 80%. Percent? Oh, 80 percent. 80% is the number that I finally ended up with after three months. Um, we're in a position with, as, as a board that, I mean, we don't have a, a set policy in place. We don't have anything in place to say um, anyone does have to do the test. We, we brought in impact testing two years ago. It was a two-year two pilot project. Um, that we brought out to, to just to see if this would help uh, with our membership and, and in managing concussions because we realized that concussions were a problem. So that was my first problem that I had with it. And since then, um, what I found is that um, different reasons that I'm having people kind of argue against the impact testing is that, like, I just had one recently where they have a, a child that got a concussion, th it was about three and a half weeks ago, um, they've had no symptoms for two weeks. Um, they've done the baseline testing, they've been there a couple times, and the tests are actually getting worse. And now they're, they're starting to doubt that the test is actually valid because, like, this is impossible. Um, so they came to see me today, and I'm by no means a professional on impact. I, I, don't, uh, I can't read the tests. Um, so all I could basically tell them is the little bit that I know is that you can be symptom free but still have a concussion. It, it, there's enough studies been done on it that, that to me I think it is a valid test and, and I, would, I, would, I told the person that you know what, you, you need to follow what the doctor says and if they say that your child's not ready, you need to listen to it whether you think they are or not. So acceptance um, of the change that needs to take place I think is, is our biggest enemy. Uh, How do you get to the point where those that you're dealing with, which I assume are mostly coaches and or parents, um, where they kind of trust what you're doing, uh, accept what you're doing, in fact, go beyond trusting and accepting, uh, believe in what you're doing? Well, I think we just, we can't quit. We have to keep pushing. 
Uh, we have to keep uh, giving them the information. Like this year, we offered a couple of sessions. Uh, we used our, your pan a lot of your panel that was up here just before us to uh, um, go to our trainers, and it was open to the membership as well to uh, come out and get information on concussions. Um, so I think the more people know, um, so the more informed they are, the more they'll understand, and the more they'll start to accept. But I think, unfortunately, patience is key. Um, it's, we're not going to change this overnight. Um, it would be great if we could change it 10 years ago, but it's not going to happen. Um, it's going to be a slow change, just like anything else. Uh, Two officials, what, what are you seeing on the ice? So for myself, um, I think as much as the players rely on us to keep them within the rules, we have started to rely uh, on them to understand that um, you know, the game is being played at a very, very high, fast pace and uh, that they you know, could possibly be a weapon out there. As much as uh, you know, it's a skill game, um, there's tons of contact, and they, ha they realize that um, they could put themselves in a position or put another player in a position to, to hurt them um, pretty badly. So to understand those risks, the inherent risk of playing this, uh, this fast, fast sport. And seven years ago, we started this check from behind. It's taken this long to get it to the point where I think minor hockey is satisfied with it, and yet we're still seeing it happen. Uh, head contact has been out two years now, and again, it's being you know, called, we think, as good as we can call it, but again, education, not only with the officials, but the coaches and everybody else, with the parents, still has to go a long way. Um, every September, we have recertification clinics for OMHA officials. They've come up with stiffer penalties for head contact, and again, I think it's getting close to the point where we can say we're being satisfied with it, but again, it's another educational thing that's going to take a long time to get rid of it. I mean, a, a player coming up the ice with their head down. I mean, the traditional understanding of that is, well, if that player is going up the ice with their head down looking at the puck, they are creating an advantage for themselves by being able to look at the puck, and therefore they should suffer the consequences for the advantage that they are creating for themselves, and therefore, basically, their fair game. And, and that may have been true at one time, when hockey was a game where the puck was advanced by the puck carrier, when stick handling was the, was the skill, and you took it up the ice, and therefore, looking down at the puck was to your advantage. It's not to your advantage anymore. You don't want a player who is looking down at the puck. So that player who's looking down at the puck now no longer has the advantage, and yet there's still this kind of sense that if that player is stupid enough to put themselves in a vulnerable enough position like that, they are fair game and a hit to the head is okay, and after all, they've lowered their head down, and therefore almost any part of the opponent's body is going to strike them in the head, and therefore they shouldn't you know, suffer the consequences for it. And I think we're beyond that. I mean, I think we're at a point of saying that you know, a hit to the head is dangerous. I mean, a hit to the head causes damage. And, and that's no longer a good enough explanation, and especially uh, if, if you, you throw out the competitive side of it because it's no longer an advantage to have your head down. I think that the head counts it as a head, hit to the head. And, and if the head counts it as a hit to the head, it's a hit to the head. And I remember Crosby in his first, and I think it was his first press conference after many months of not speaking, he had just one simple phrase that I thought was just perfect. I mean, why didn't the rest of us think of it beforehand? He said, the league asks us to be responsible for our sticks. Now, anybody, doesn't matter, you know, you get somebody in the face with your stick, and it doesn't matter how it happens, you're going to get a penalty for high sticking. The league has said you are responsible for your stick. So Crosby's phrase was, the league asks us to be responsible for our sticks. Why shouldn't it ask us to be responsible for our bodies? That a hit to the head has no purpose other than injury. I mean, you know, there's no reason to hit somebody in the head to, to get the puck or anything else. You can do other things to get the puck. A hit to the head is an intent to injure. You can generate exceptions of where, well, 
this guy was looking to draw a penalty, so he purposely put his, you know, his, his body forward and his head towards the boards, looking to have somebody hit him from behind into the boards to draw a penalty. Well, we have penalties now for diving, for instigating, for generating a penalty that otherwise wouldn't be a penalty. <coughs> I think that we we are getting farther. You know, um, maybe look the, the, that World Junior play where everyone got excited, uh, saying it was uh, who came down. I think uh, Anthony Camara came down and hit uh, from the blue line, and, and the player had his head down. And it was a big hit, and everyone thought, you know, that is part of hockey. That's part of the game. That should be no call. Well, at the same time, Camara had his head up, looking, skating at the player, and understanding that he had his head down. And you have to, as a player, we haven't been taught this, but Again, we're starting to teach kids that if you see a player with his head down, you, 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 can't, you can't hit him. You're, you're, not, you're not allowed to anymore. You, you can hit him in, in a legal way with a shoulder, hopefully to the chest, which is what Kamara did, but he was maybe going a little too fast, so maybe he charged him a little bit. So you have to find other ways to, to take the puck or take advantage of these players without making that big hit that we think is part of hockey over the last you know, 10, 15 years. That game that I saw you play against Sarnia, where, um, you know, from uh, the, the 50 minutes or so that I saw of the game, that it was played at a really high level, smart play, skilled play, as exciting as one could want to play or to watch, and with every opportunity for stupid and not one moment of stupid, is that, was that a rarity, or is that starting to become the way in which the OHL is played. Yeah, that's the way it's starting to be played. And I think what you described earlier, that classic uh, Scott Stevens body check on Lindros, which was not only accepted, it was applauded for 30 and 40 years. Um, I can remember uh, when David Branch uh, were starting to take the initiative and myself sitting with, you know, the Brian Kilrays and the Larry Mavities and Hartsey happened to be Craig Hartsbrook sitting with me. and you know, aghast at what David was suggesting, which is what you were suggesting, that it should not be, you know, the exception that we allow it. It should be the norm, okay? No tolerance, hitting to the head, okay? It's no longer there. And uh, frankly, with all due respect to the National Hockey League and their administrators, I think if they had somebody as strong-willed as David Branch and prepared to take as strong a stance as David Branch, I think it would be cleared up at that level 50 or 60 percent more than it currently is. And let's face it, the whole hockey world follows the National Hockey League, okay? So uh, that would be the, uh, the biggest uh, step forward that we could take if the National League was even more aggressive than they are. But is there a protocol of when, when, it, when a kid goes down, and I, and I went through this with people in Thunder Bay, and they didn't have a protocol of when a kid goes down, who makes the call as to whether the kid can continue to play? Can the, can the referee make the call and sort of look at the state of the kid and say, sorry, your night's done? Or is it the coach's call? Or is it the um, uh, trainer, the team trainer's call? And, uh, and then if they make the call, I mean, if there is a protocol and that call is made, then what needs, is there a protocol about then what needs to happen before that player can return to play? Well, right now it's the trainer that has the call. And uh, basically what we have is recommended guidelines is what we have. Um, if it's a su suspected concussion, uh, the recommendation is that you go to see your family doctor. That's, you're not back on the ice. It doesn't matter if it's a practice or a game. If you suspect that there's a concussion, you're off the ice, and we tell the trainers to tell them to go to their family doctor and be assessed. But it's recommended, it's not a requirement. At this point, it's not a requirement. That's something that we're going to be looking at probably over the summer as to whether we can. Uh, and do I mean, I'm, more. I'm sure you've experienced it, but and I know I've heard it from other coaches is that, is that what that leads to, of course, is that that team over there is being really lenient. Their guys are always playing. We're being tough and appropriate. Our guys aren't playing. They beat us every time. This isn't right. And, and what they're saying to me 
you know, is just give us a protocol. Give, it, give us something that is an even playing field. And even if we end up losing you know, a couple of players for longer than we would hope, if we know that the other guy is losing a couple of players for longer than they would hope as well, then we're fine. You know, we can live with all of that. But if we don't have that protocol, then, well, and I, I suspect that some of that has to do with the challenges that you were talking about in doing the job that you would like to well, do. Well, exactly, because I, I, it's going to be one of those things where at some point we have to rely on the trainers, the coaching staff, the parents, the kid, everybody to be honest about what's happened, and, and that's a challenge. If, if a player, and it might be a, you know, a significant player on a team, is, is hurt with a concussion, then the reaction of the team would be, this is an overwhelming catastrophe. How can we survive this as a team? And, and we're really in a, in a bad state. An impression that I have now is that that's starting to change. And, that, and in part, it's because teams have enough players out, uh, you know, with concussions over the course of a year, that you've had lots of experience of dealing with the loss of somebody who seems to be a player that one can't lose and carry on, and you've discovered that you can still play and still compete.